Welcome to the Morally End. My name is Mark Machado. I'm joined by um, Sri Lanka's premier cricket historian, um, Nick Brooks, author of An Island's Eleven. If you haven't read it already, what are you doing? Get it on your Christmas list. If you celebrate Christmas, if you don't, then ask for it for the new year. I don't know if the new year's presents are a thing, but there you go. Um, if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button. It's really important for us that you do. Um, hit the like button, leave us your comments, and um, feel free to join the WhatsApp group where we kind of update that uh, when when Shrug can play uh, with, with news and little bits of information as it's coming through. We can't see your number. You can't see our number. We've also got a newsletter. We've been a bit slack in it the last week or two, mainly because we've been quite busy with other work trying to pay our bills. But we'll get back onto that. Do not worry about that. A mortgage, if you're in the UK, Saudi Arabia, or the UAE, Mike Ward Mortgages, can help you out. Mike is a great guy who knows a lot about mortgages. Uh, get in touch with him. All the details are in the description. And don't forget to tell him you came to him through Murali End. Um, Nick, let's get into it. We're talking about Sri Lanka's 2-1 series win over the West Indies um, in, in, its, in the ODI series. I'm kind of hesitating there because my first thought is, is Sri Lanka is so far away from a next meaningful kind of ODI tournament, as are the West Indies, in fact. I kind of want to say, wouldn't we have been better off just playing T20s, like six T20s? Yeah, I mean, I guess six T20s would have made more sense, Marky. By the way, hey, nice to be back. It's been a real while. I know, it's been a while. <laughs> I feel like I haven't done this in a long, long time. So it's great to be here. But yeah, uh, neither of these teams are going to be at the Champions Trophy. Uh, so it does feel slightly like a series that's lacking a bit of context. Uh, and also one where the weather made itself a major part of the narrative, which is never something that you want to hear in um, a cricket series. Although I do feel with like the way that things went down yesterday in the third ODI, uh, it kind of balanced out because a lot of the talk after the, last, the first two ODIs was that the weather had played in Sri Lanka's favour. I think yesterday it um, really hurt them. Uh, given the way that Patham and Avishka started, they were building a platform for 50 overs and then the game got reduced to much shorter than that. Was it 23 overs it ended up being? Uh, but yeah, um, so a funny little series, uh, but I think one that threw up a lot more positives than negatives for Sri Lanka, which, um, yeah, let's get into. I think there's a lot to be excited about. More good feels, another series win. And um, yes, yeah, some good discoveries from this series, I feel like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just about the Champions Trophy, right? Because I think kind of definitely I had this idea that maybe Pakistan or India wouldn't turn up and Sri Lanka might end, you know, might be asked last to that door. Yeah, to, to, to take up a place. Kind of like Denmark at, at Euro 92 and obviously <laughs> always come off the beach and straight on to, to and, uh, you know, go on a great run and, and win the thing is what my thought was. But actually speaking to a few of the journalists who've been out in Pakistan with um, with the England team last few weeks, the, the kind of sand coming out of Pakistan is, is that regardless of what, what happens about where this tournament needs to be played or will be played, they will definitely be partaking in it because there's so much in terms of television rights deals that are relied on that India-Pakistan game taking place, regardless of whether it's in Pakistan or, or somewhere else, that that will almost definitely happen. So I think, you know, any hopes that we had of getting to the Champions Trophy are now well and truly dead, 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 dead. Unless, yeah. of course, I don't know, South Africa pulled out or something like that. Um, and I think the trophy's worse for it. What is cricket without the island boys, right? Sri Lanka and the West Indies, I know they're my teams, but I think everyone in the world loves these two teams and uh, tournament cricket without them feels like it's missing a little bit of sparkle. I absolutely, obviously I absolutely agree with you. I'm like totally biased as well. Um, anyway, should we get into the into the series? So it was a slightly kind of stranger squad for Sri Lanka. Um, it was good to see Dilshan Madhushanka back. Um, the, the my main takeaway when I kind of looked at the squad and also the kind of teams they were putting out with Sidira and the Ardege in the side was that actually I feel like this format because it's the furthest away from being of any importance at the moment with you know the, the London game a, a potential we'll, we're going to talk about that before the end of this episode and and also you know a T20 World Cup at home in the next kind of eighteen months oh no maybe a bit longer than eighteen months anyway um, then this this 
one day international seems like the least important format for Schlunker at the moment. So it feels to me like they they were bringing in players that they kind of just wanted to have a look at, right? Um, we've got to talk about what happened in the first two games of the opening batters because Patton was injured and Madushka comes in um, and does an absolutely incredible job, I think. And then the third match when Patton's back back from injury, he gets dropped and Madushka keeps his place. Which to me sounds a li- oh, it just felt a little bit unfair. But my job is just to talk about the team, not to actually pick a team that could potentially win a tournament in the future, right? Yeah, it's a strange one because I um, wholeheartedly agree, Marky. Nisha Madushka came in for his ODI debut in the first match and looked great, right? Really well organised, scoring at a good lick, playing. Uh, traditional cricket shots, not doing anything sort of too fancy, too modern. But there was that stage in the first ODI where I think Sri Lanka were reduced to what sort of 50 for three, 40 for three even. And they looked in a bit of trouble and Madushka and Charith put together a really good partnership. I think they scored something like 140 odd in 18 overs to kind of totally change the complexion of that game. And yeah, Madushka had... Another nice knock in the second ODI, you've got to say he did nothing wrong, looked much more controlled, uh, much better suited to being a white ball opener than he has done as a test opener in the last few months. So it's a bit of a surprise that he was dropped for the third ODI when Patham came back. But I think that's a suggestion in my eyes from Sri Lanka that they see Avishka as the long-term guy and that even if he gets a couple of low scores, we know he's a boom or bust player, right? And the dismissals that we saw from him in the first two ODIs are the kind of dismissals we've seen from him quite a lot, looking a bit flat-footed, edging balls to slip and point. But we know that once he gets past 10, once he gets past 15, how dangerous and combustive he can be. We saw a little snapshot of that yesterday even though he got out right before the rain came but yeah so I think the sense is that they're going to stick with Avishka Fernando as the opener in this ODI side through thick and thin for a good little while but I mean it's great to see the strength and depth that Sri Lanka are developing and Nisha Madushka sitting on the bench has to be a positive thing uh you mentioned the fact that Sadira and Liana Gay were included in this team both guys who've done really pretty well over the past 18 months so it's hard to begrudge either guy a space in the top six but I think we've got to talk about the fact that Kamindu Mendes is batting at seven uh, wasn't dismissed at all throughout the series looked really really good in the first ODI when he came in to finish and I mean I personally think that he's too good a player not to be batting in the top six and I'd really like to see him batting at number four in this team as harsh as that seems on Sadira. So, so, so the vibe I get from this team, right, is that it kind of feels like Sadith is calling around the boys and being like, look, lads, this is ODI series. We don't need to take it too seriously. Come down and have a knock. It's the kind of international equivalent of Sunday cricket. Um, like, have a good time. Kamindu's, like, turned up. They were kind of maybe weren't expecting him to play. He had had, you know, he battered the day before for his for his club in, in the county league and done really well. Now he's turned up the next day. And they kind of feel a bit like, we want to give the other boys a bit of a knock, see what they can do. Um, but I agree, it feels like such a waste to have him this low down. I mean, it's great for his averages. I mean, he added 31 runs <laughs> for no wicket. So um, like, I suppose that's good. But I agree, I think it's really bizarre. I kind of feel that actually, kind of when you look at Kamindu's year, and like, you know, to blow our own trumpet for a little bit, Murali, and hit the subscribe if you haven't done so already. We've been kind of talking about this being his year since that, was it the Bangladesh series? Yes. Yeah. So, this guy's not put a foot wrong because he did he did quite well in the T20s against Bangladesh early on. It's great, didn't he? And that was sort of his international coming out. I mean, after he hadn't been seen much since that Australia test a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I kind of feel like, actually, it's all kind of come together really quickly for him. And the, the the team kind of don't know what to do. It kind of reminds me a little bit of when Hasaranga had that incredible LPL last season with both bat and ball. And after that, they kind of gave him the captaincy, didn't know what to do with him and just let him have kind of free reign of it. 
And I think they've gone kind of totally the other way with, with Kamindi now, where it's like, right, if he's doing it at T20 and he's doing it at Test cricket, he most likely could do it at ODI cricket, right? That's the the kind of bridge between the two, like in in some ways. But they, there's no, um, there doesn't appear to be any sort of um, kind of thinking about right. Let he's he's our one of our best hitters off the ball. Let's see what he can do. Let's push up to three or four, and then kind of take it from there. Especially when, in a what there was points in that in the in the first and second test where Sri Lanka looked really comfortable, and they they didn't look like anything was. Was going, I suppose maybe when it was three for forty-five for three, then maybe that might have been a moment where they thought, okay, maybe we need to hold them off a little bit. But you know, we talked about this is this is a a ODI series that what should have been about experimentation, and I think they missed the trick here. Though they might say, actually, you know, Liana Gay, Sadira, and Madushka have haven't done a huge amount wrong. We wanted to give them a chance as well. That's the kind of thinking you often associate with kind of you know England and Australia. And, and increasingly even India as well. So maybe Sri Lanka was trying to kind of grow into that a little bit. Yeah, and I see that argument. Um, and you'd have to say that Sadira nor Lianage have done anything wrong. And Lianage has actually, I think, exceeded most people's expectations once he's been in the side. But I think everyone would agree, and it's pretty clear, that Kamindu seems to have a higher ceiling than either of those guys, a much higher ceiling in my eyes uh and yeah i mean you know he's i see one just one icc player of the month he's arguably the form player in international cricket over the past three four months and his game just looks like it's so suited to odis you know he's a naturally aggressive player he can score runs all around the wicket he hit a couple of sixes in that first odi he seems like he's got the game to kind of do a bit of everything uh so I wonder when whether we'll see him batting in the top four in the near future. I mean, I also think that you've got to say that, you know, Sri Lanka for this series were kind of, you know, using a combination of Kamindu, Asalanka and Lianage as their fifth bowler. And you wonder whether that's a tactic which will work in countries outside of Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. I mean... Well, it's straight in, up, you say it's not going to work, is it? It's, it's not going to work. But, I mean, I guess then the flip side of that coin is if you can field a team where you've got Kamindu at seven, Hasaranga at eight, Wellalaga at nine, I mean, that's uh, pretty unprecedented batting depth for Sri Lanka. And maybe it's a sort of back to the 90s kind of vibe of, yeah, Will's just score more than you. Uh, I don't know. I think it'll be really interesting to see what kind of team Sri Lanka line up with in an away series. Uh, we haven't seen them play an away ODI under Sanath yet, right? We've just seen them play two series at home where they've kind of gone with one frontline seamer and a bag full of spinners. Uh, personally, one thing that I will say is I just think that Mahesh Thikshana had a great run out in the second ODI, right? Dilshan Madhashanka, who was so good at the World Cup last year. And I feel since we saw him at that World Cup, we haven't like seen him play a lot of cricket. And he's still pretty raw. And for me, Thik sat out the first ODI. Um, Madhashanka sat out the first two. I think those guys have got to be playing every ODI for Sri Lanka. And yeah. You want, like, Madhashankar's still raw, right? He's still learning. And we saw he didn't have a great time of it yesterday. He went for 50 and 5. But I think he's got to be getting that experience at home and away. And those guys are going to be crucial building blocks. And you want them playing as much cricket as possible. It's, it's the, I don't know. It's it's not just the shrunken thing, but it feels to me like quite acutely shrunken thing where we kind of expect players to either come back from injury or come straight into the team and kind of hit the ground running straight away. And that, in, in international cricket, regardless of the format, that happens so rare. It's so it's so rarely that it happens. I mean, uh, Madushka, before he gets injured, uh, sorry, Dilja Madushanka, before he gets injured, is basically one of the best left-hand seamers in the world, right? He, he's um, on the top of the shopping list of almost every franchise going. He's got a contract at Mumbai Indians. He gets injured. We don't see him for, what, six, seven, eight, nine months? I can't remember the last time we saw him play. 
Um, we can't be expecting him to come in, especially to a pitch like like the one in Candy was, and kind of be picking up wickets all over the place. He's going to need a little time to get back into it. Um, you know, not that only a few weeks ago we were talking about whether or not Shrug should take him to South Africa for the Test series or or get him ready to face Australia in the, in the Test match. At the moment, if he's going to do, if that's even on the radar, he's just got to play a lot more cricket. And I know. In Sri Lanka, you could basically play a domestic cricket match every day of the year if you wanted to. But he needs to play against the best players as much as possible. Um, talk about teaching now, I thought he was phenomenal in that second match. I also felt that he looks a lot fitter and a lot stronger than he has done ever. Um, he's playing, he's been, since, you know, since that India series, he's been playing quite a bit of franchise cricket all over the place. I think he was in, he was in the CPL. I think he went to Zimbabwe as well. He definitely played somewhere else, um, in between. And you can tell he's, uh, you know, I'm not saying he wasn't taking it seriously before he obviously was, but he's obviously put a lot of work into getting himself into better physical shape, um, in order to, to be more robust, I suppose, for the, for the challenges of international cricket and, it did feel that we are kind of paying a bit of a, di- you know, seeing the dividends from that hard work. And really like ragging that off break, right? There was some, yeah. especially in that second ODI, that turned big, which is not something you, you associate with Deeks. I think that first wicket that he took, Alec Athanes, um, beautiful, sort of perfect off break. And then he, yeah, I think was it... Um, he, when he was bowling to, I can't remember who, someone in the middle order, one of the right-handers that he was getting them to turn back a long way. And with the arsenal that he's got, the carom ball, uh, those little kind of swinging seamers and everything, I'm, I, he's just looking really, really dangerous. I personally thought it was quite a resurgent series for him and for Hasaranga, who obviously both come with huge reputations, but maybe we'd say haven't had the kind of best time of things over the past 12 months and I thought that both of them were outstanding throughout this series when Indu um, was you know causing a lot of problems with the Googlies it seemed like a number of the West Indies batsmen were really struggling to pick him and yeah it just um, both felt good from those guys I thought it was another good series for Asitha who is increasingly growing into his role as a white ball seamer uh he just has the ability to mix things up and do damage on pitches which aren't necessarily that receptive to seam bowling, right? And I can see why, if you're going to go with one seamer in these conditions, he is uh, being picked over Madashanka. Um, Obviously, that's not going to work everywhere. It was um, one thing I did want to touch on, Marky, is that that second ODI where... West Indies were eight down. I think it was Rutherford and Moti and they had a bit of a comeback. And yeah, the foot came off the throat a bit. And I was just sat there thinking this would be a great time to introduce someone like Paterana or even a Tushara. And I understand why Paterana hasn't been playing 50 over cricket. I think that for now, keeping him as a T20 specialist is the way to go. But I hope the idea of him as an ODI cricketer hasn't been abandoned altogether and that it's something we might see in the longer term. Um, So for me, that was always the most interesting part of the whole series, right? Because Sri Lanka had done that thing where they got wickets in early on in clumps and then got actually kind of gone through most of the team. And then they just let those two sit in and just really create a total that was going to take a not it didn't you know at the end of the day it was a comfortable win for Shrunker but could have caused them a lot more chase. it yeah. wasn't like and it looked like they were going to be blown out for what under 100 or yeah and it I think last year when we go back to when we were talking about the the 50 over World Cup there was a number of occasions where kind of I felt that that would happen again where they just let batters kind of get away find a bit of form Rutherford looked incredible and Man, what a great series for him. And he'd hardly played any ODI cricket coming into it. And now yeah. you've got to um, think he's an automatic pick. And Guna Keshimoti, like for me, probably is actually kind of the player of the series because it kind of, at some moments in the game, it, in some of these games, it felt like him versus Sri Lanka, right? Yeah, um, no, I've, um, I've been a fan of his bowling for a while, but I had no idea that he could bat. And he played a couple of, well, that knock in the second ODI, there was one in the T20s as well where he really got after it. Um, no, very impressive. 
on the basis that he bats at number 10, I'm thinking that I don't think many people realise he could bat like that. And I think it's... <laughs> I so, so I'm not sure if what happens is, is they kind of think, all right, we've got a bit of a problem here. We might need to try something else. A little bit too late? Yeah, um, it did seem like it. <laughs> yeah, or, or if they... They actually like just back themselves so much. They think, no, no, this whatever they're doing at that point is going to continue to work. I kind of felt when we, when me and you were at all the test matches in England, we kind of saw a bit of a similar thing where sometimes they would just do the same thing over and over and over again to batters who were well set, and you were like, you need to try something different, like bring on a spinner or something. Um, I mean, that's what I mean. That's the sort of situation where if you've got a Paterano up your sleeve. He can come in and just like totally disrupt rhythm. Uh, yeah, so, that's, so, so that, but but I think the Paterada thing goes back to the whole. This is the third format. This is very much the third format. This is the format where we're bringing in the players coming back from injury. Players want to have a look at. Uh, we're we're going to bring in Sadira and Leon again. It's important that both of them bat because we don't want them coming in and and not doing anything because you want to have a look at them at, at, at the t- highest level or as high a level as we at this point we can give them space to to, to play in because we might potentially need them somewhere down the line um it's been about a year since we got knocked out the the 50 over world cup and my kind of question to you is nick is do you think that there's been sufficient enough change in the way that the squads are coming together and what we're seeing. And I, this isn't, you can't really compare it format to format because we've basically essentially played, I think, what, nine ODIs since and not really taking it very seriously. But do you think we have seen significant enough change in the way Stoke Cricket is run and the way they're bringing talent through that if there is a next time we go to a major tournament and there is a injury crisis, that it won't result in the kind of chaos we saw last time? Yeah, I think we. I do think we've seen enough. Um, I'd say growth rather than change. Right. Uh, I was really, really impressed with the innings Charith played in that first ODI, um, and I thought throughout the series he looked superb, and he just keeps on growing and growing. Um, we've seen a lot of growth from Patham since that ODI World Cup. Right. It still felt very much then that it was. Kusul Mendes and the rest. I know Sadira had a good tournament path and grew into that tournament. But now I think this batting lineup looks a lot more rounded, a lot more threatening. And I mean, it's hard to say exactly where Sri Lanka are on the bowling side of things because we ha- haven't seen them play ODI cricket away from home for a little while. But I do feel like this team is better set up, is set up to do better than they did at the last ODI World Cup. But then again, it was a disappointing performance then. And we've got that thing where we keep saying they're in a good place and then they go to big tournaments and do rubbish. So it's um, it's a little hard to tell. But I think, yeah, I think this team's growing. Uh, and I mean, you look at what Sri Lanka A are doing at the moment. I'm sure we'll touch on that at some stage. Uh, and it's it feels like there's depth and strength. Uh, I know they lost the game yesterday. But it was really impressive to see them come out after the rain delay and add 75 in five and a bit overs because Mendes was just on fire, wasn't he? Uh, no, I'm like feeling good about where this team is in all three formats at the moment. So as good as I have been in a long time. Yeah, there's depth. We're competitive. Or we could, we should be competitive. Uh, um... <laughs> And yeah, the, the, it feels to me like there's kind of there is somewhere deep in it a bit for strategy, and it, we're kind of seeing the, the the fruits of it. It's interesting. It'd be good, you know. Me and Dominic were talking on WhatsApp the other day about trying to get a few people from from Sri Lanka to talk about wh- how it's all kind of come together. How much of it is is the Sanathera? How much of it is the kind of pre Sanathera and, and the work that Mahela did? to kind of lay those foundations in place to get players, good domestic players, into ready to play international cricket, right? Um, because it feels to me like there is a lot going on. We're seeing, you know, over over the English summer, we saw the kind of fruits of the, the shrunken fast bowling school. Um, and now we're, we're potentially seeing the fruits of some of the hard work of the 
a kind of batting school if there is such a thing yeah um i don't think it's all sanath this transformation but i don't think you can downplay the yeah. inspiration factor right and i think it's clear that he's connected with players in a way that Chris Silverwood couldn't and that Mickey Arthur probably couldn't and that actually not many people could and that's like one of these intangibles right uh it's just I think down to the respect and admiration that all of these players probably have for Sanath Jayasuriya and him being able to tap into something in their psyche that not many people could and I think you also can't overlook the fact that he the arc of his career right that he hung around in international cricket for a long time without fulfilling his potential and then became a world beater and i think having someone who's been through the same kind of struggles that you have talk to you and say look you don't need to change a lot but with a bit of confidence you can be a world-class player i think that probably hits home pretty hard and it just feels like there's a really good vibe in the squad at the moment right and i think we saw you know at the last two at the t20 world cup and the 50 over world club cup as kind of deep rooted uh fear of failure or a sense that when things aren't going right sri lanka kind of crumbled and there was that sort of slight innate confidence lacking and i think that's starting to build up and so it should be because i mean you look at the results that we've seen from the ODI series victory against India, winning a test in England and being really competitive throughout that series, smashing New Zealand, who've just gone on to hammer India, and now winning a T20 and an ODI series against the West Indies side, who, look, they're not at full strength. They're without Dre Russ, they're without Poran, but it's a good team nonetheless. I mean, I was, yeah, I like, you look at that bowling attack, it's impressive. They bat really deep, the West Indies. So this, like, you know, I don't think that... Um, we should downplay, you know, the, the way that Sri Lanka have dominated this series. And yeah, I think there should be a lot of confidence around this squad right now. It's been a great series for you, Nick, because one of your sides got the vic the series victory. The other side got the moral victory. Um, can, can yeah, we talk it's always a good series for me. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we talk about Darren Savvy's moral victory comments, though? Because I think they're... <clears throat> I, I can make an argument for each and every side of this, right? Um, yeah. Personally, and foremost, I salute Darren Sammy for bringing a bit of needle into what is generally considered quite a genteel series. Um, because, you know, at Murray End, we love a bit of shit housing. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if, if Sri Lanka West Indies can get anywhere near those guys across the, the Bay of Bengal type rivalry, then that would be absolutely brilliant for Sri Lankan cricket, West Indian cricket, and all cricket. Um, but I suspect the uncles of Colombo won't ever let that happen because I think that, in my opinion, and I could be totally wrong here, I don't think there's any other Krypton culture that Sri Lankans are, are brought up to uh, respect more than West Indian cricket. And I think the fact that Darren Sammy called it, you know, said it was a moral victory. And I, I don't know if Darren Sammy realises the role that, that West Indian cricket has in Sri Lanka. I think when he said that, it must have hurt uncles in the heart <laughs> like yeah, man. to a lot of souls uh, um, in stabbed to the chest of many an uncle across colombo and i think you're right marky there's a real respect for west indian cricket in sri lanka right and quite a culture of exchange i mean leary constantine was in sri lanka as coach back in the day gary sobers came and coached and people in sri lanka especially uncles who were around for that sort of um well, yeah, the 80s, they love a bit of Viv, don't they? They love a bit yeah. of West Indian cricket. Uh, I don't know what to make. I I, I, I I rate Sammy coming out and saying that it was a moral victory, but I'm not sure how much I buy into it. Uh, I, But I do think that there's a sort of more serious point as to whether really turning pitches are benefiting Sri Lanka long term. I guess you can make more of an argument for playing on them in T20s than you can in ODIs, given the fact that the T20 World Cup's going to be partially at home. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just interesting to see how Sri Lanka do when they go away, right? Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see what um, 
what happens holding this strategy. Because if you look at Bangladesh, they've basically had the same strategy and it's worked out horribly for them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, people will be, rightfully so, screaming at this at me saying, firstly, why did you mention their name? And I'll say it's because I forgot not to say it. And secondly, um, we have better cricketers than they do in general, which I think probably is right. But also, I think their cricket culture has developed into only being able to play on certain pitches, which is what we want to need to avoid. Yeah. Loss. I also, like, the other thing I will add is I don't think all our pitches are as extreme turners uh, as everywhere in Bangladesh appears. Well, I'd agree. And I think actually a lot of these surfaces have been decent white ball surfaces. I don't think they've been like, they've, they've turned, but they, I don't think they've been sort of like um, outrageous. They were a bit, they were more so for the T20 series and the ODI series, right? The Dan Buller pitches were yeah. um, more favourable to spin than the candy pitches. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's, that, that, that's, I think, true. I mean, although uh, Candy did turn big as well. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, yeah um, I don't know. I, I don't know what to think about this. I think that Sri Lanka has more has enough firepower to do well on good batting pitches. I like to see them play on a more of a diversity of pitches. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah, and also I think we we might be heading to a stage now, right? Where you look at some of our best players, they're playing so much franchise cricket that. Um, over the course of a kind of seven or eight month period, they're basically playing on every surface, right? So uh, maybe we don't need to to worry about that in terms yeah. of having the top um, team. I think we've got to hope that we're going to see more. I mean, we've seen a lot of Sri Lankan bowlers playing franchise cricket. I think we've got to hope that this season we're going to see more Sri Lankan batters picking up some gigs. I would really, really hope to see both Patham and Kamindu Um picking up some good franchise opportunities, if not quite IPL gigs, then, you know, SA20s, ILT20s, um, and maybe PSL gigs getting around the circuit and seeing what they can do in those contexts. Yeah, PSL has been playing at the same time as the IPL next season. So hopefully there's a lot more kind of spots available. Yeah. For our best batters. Um, should we talk about this emerging teams? Uh, final because Sri Lanka have got to the Asia, the Emergent Teams Asia Cup final, um, and they're going to play Afghanistan, which in itself is quite an interesting story, right? Because obviously, going into it, Pakistan and India would have been the favourites to to get all the way through. But actually, and I, I, I can't comment about the Afghan teams. I don't know enough about them. I know a few of them have played a bit of franchise cricket around the world just in case Ahmed and people like that play around. But this Sri Lanka side that's coming in is, A, definitely an emerging side, right? There's players in there that we, we've been talking about as people who in, you know, even a meet like next week or in the next couple of months could do something for the national side if needed to. And, and some of them who've, who've got a bit of experience with the national team um, as well. The, the squad has Samantha who went to, the, um, he was at the World Cup last year, I think if I remember correctly. Um, Ravish Mendes is there. Ishan Malingo is there. Nasir Cruz Pillay, who we, we've been talking about for ages, um, is in the squad. Um, can't get a game. Can't, yeah. De and Niro. it's interesting oh, to me that they've gone for someone like Yashoda Lanka, who's done really well in domestic cricket of late, but is, you know, 32. They've picked him over someone like Chef Daniel, who, um, you know, is seen as a long-term prospect, but maybe hasn't scored as much, doesn't have the weight of runs behind him recently. So, I mean, it's. I wonder if it's a look at some of these guys and saying that someone like Yashoda Lanka, can he come into a uh, full Sri Lanka squad in the near future? Yeah. I don't know. They, yeah, there seems to be like the eye on, although there's, it's a de developmental squad, it seems to have a, not necessarily like a, a long-term, a, a near-term vision as well as a long-term vision, I think is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I wonder how the other, other teams are approaches. And I can't, you know, I don't know enough about what's going on in Afghan and Pakistani cricket to say, um, you know, th their approach is similar to ours or not similar to ours. Uh, you know, Mohammed Al Harris is, it was the captain of the Pakistan team. I know he's someone they were talking about as potentially captain in the full white ball side since Bubba has, has stepped down, which I thought was quite interesting that that's the way they saw that trajectory because I don't think the Windu Fernando will be captaining the any Sri Lanka white ball team anytime. In no, the, but I think, 
Um, we're going to see new and in squads, in full squads, sort of probably sooner rather than later. Yeah. Uh, I think he looks really impressive. Uh, Ahan, let me get his name right, Wickram, a singer, has um, scored runs and again looks like a really good young player. Uh, it's yeah, I think it's a very exciting little outfit, and the runs have been shared around the top six, top seven. Uh, I know Dom's really high on Ishan Malinga, and he seems like a good prospect for the future. Hamantha's taken loads of wickets. Um, Pavan Ratnayak is obviously really exciting. So it's um showcase of uh, just the, yeah, that depth again, isn't it? And I mean, very surprised that someone like Vijay Kant, um isn't in that squad. But again, that's another sign of how much Sri Lanka's got going on right now. Yeah, it seems like, apart from the fact that we keep falling apart at ICC tournaments, it feels like we're kind of in a good place, right? Yeah, I think, yeah, like we keep saying, this, we we said this loads. We, we keep saying this when we talk about almost all the formats at the moment. I uh, just certainly think there's a far deeper stable of players than there was five years ago. Yeah, and that actually Sri Lanka has cover in all areas now. I mean, where you look at just like take leg spinners, you've got Hasaranga, you've got Vanders, you've got Hamantha, you've got Vijayaskant. Like it's. Great depth, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 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 good. It's good. Yeah, it's good. Let's celebrate. Um, should we have a little chat about? I mean, should I have a lot of cricket to come, right? Because I was going to say, should we have a little chat about the the Test series coming up? Because, um, but we've got to play New Zealand in white ball cricket before before that. Yes, yeah, like, right now. Isn't it? Pardon? Non-stop cricket right now. Non-stop cricket right now. I feel all kind of like momentum in Sri Lanka at the moment is talking about this London game and whether or not we can make it. Um, well, I my, think... my, all, all my calculations, even before the weekend, were kind of like, well, India will beat New Zealand and win that series. So they, they lost the first test and they'll win two more and they'll go to Australia. And then it's kind of figuring out if one of these two teams can win or lose enough, can lose enough that kind of puts Sri Lanka in a place that by the time we play Australia at the end of January, that was, was still kind of in the race. But with India suddenly losing to to New Zealand, two tests and a whole series, that, that it doesn't, the series points, there's no series points. So it's just the number of tests on, the, on that table. I think it kind of suddenly feels like the whole thing's a bit thrown up in the air because it kind of feels like New Zealand, the kind of could potentially make a late, I don't even know who they've got to play. Um, um, I think, England are going to New Zealand next. Is that for tests? Uh, I think so. Um, South Africa are still a bit in the running, but certainly I think India losing. And uh, you'd have to say, given that Australia beat India on neutral soil last summer, that they are favourites for that series at home. And, you know, so if they can do India, it's five tests. I don't know if they win that 3-1, 4-1 and Sri Lanka take a test in South Africa. I mean, there are all sorts of hypotheticals here, but I think Sri Lanka is still right in this WTC race. And um, I'm hugely excited for that series in South Africa. Uh, it's Same. So, 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 so can I just clarify, because I, I just looked it up, and, and New Zealand have three tests after the, the third test against India. They have three tests against England in New Zealand. Um. So just for clarity, we want as much chaos with results as possible around, apart from our own results. Obviously, we want to win as many games as possible. If we can get three wins out of the next four tests, we put ourselves in a pretty decent position, right? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think you'd expect that series between England and New Zealand to be really like close and well contested, as it was the last time England were there. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, and, you know, South Africa have deprioritised test cricket and... You wonder whether they'll be full strength. Uh, they had a they had a pretty solid bowling attack, didn't they? Playing against Bangladesh, um, I saw Rabada just took his what three hundredth wicket, four hundredth Test wicket, and is um, he was taking them a, a real lick. I think it's one of the great tragedies of the modern game how little Test cricket he's getting to play because he really is one of the all time great bowlers. Yeah. Uh, but their bowling's strong. Their batting, I think, is. Um, 
Well, it's a bit less proven, isn't it? I mean, you look at the players that they've got in that lineup, guys who haven't played a load of Test cricket, like, you know, Dezorzi, Stubbs, Rickleton, um, all talented players, but they're green. And I mean, I think in modern times, you don't quite know what kind of wickets you're going to get in South Africa. They're not necessarily as always as favourable to pace bowling as we traditionally think. So I think there are a lot of interesting things about that series. Uh, Sri Lanka are going to go there feeling really confident, right? I mean, the Test cricket's been going great over the past six months. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm so excited for that series. Uh, I think we'd be happy with one all, and that would keep us in the running. So I I think ideally you want to win that two 0 You want to win that two 0 because I just think that Australia. I know I know we're going to end. I imagine we'll end up playing them in Gaul and Australia like. If you watch the second series of the test, they do not like playing at Gore. Yeah, um, you've got to think that it's going to be like like I want you want rank turners, right? Yeah. Let's get the, let's go Pakistan. Let's get the fans out. Yeah, get get the fans <laughs> out. Get um, the fans out. Dry that pitch right out, and um, you know anything to win. It's the opposite of let's play on surfaces. Like what we've been saying about white ball. Let's make it. Let's doctor that pitch as much as possible. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Any little advantage we could get, we should take. Um, th- there's two things I need to tell you right now, um, if you're watching or listening. Firstly, um, if you're interested in, in the Indian cricket team, we do have an Indian cricket show that kind of accompanies Marillion called Kumbhale Corner. Um, you should hear what I'm going to call the England show when we get around to that. And uh, um, also, I will be at... Um, the Boxing Day test at the MCG. And I will be, I'm quite open about this now, I'll be supporting whichever team benefits Sri Lanka winning the most. I won't be able to make that call. I think I think that's the third test in that series. I won't be able to make that call till after the second test. The other thing I should mention that I keep, I can't stop thinking about is, Nick, if we'd won those two matches against Pakistan, we'd be top of the table right now. I think that really, really hurts in hindsight, doesn't it? Uh, and gosh, I mean, just... I think we said it at the time. I think we all said it at the time. We were like, "What are we doing here?" Yeah, right. and uh, um, and I think if the Sri Lanka team of today uh, wouldn't have lost that series two 0 I think that the um, yeah, especially if, we, if we'd won even one of those, we'd be I think we'd actually those. technically be second. I think. Yeah, um, those two losses look really, really bad in hindsight and might end up costing Sri Lanka pretty dear. Um, yeah. If we'd won those two, we could have then lost two tests against South Africa and Australia and still be in, in the mix, probably, most likely. We don't know. Like, I mean, people, me and you both live in England and in England people are quite pessimistic about the future of test cricket i think rightfully so because from an english perspective test cricket isn't really working here at the moment um but i do think england need to embrace the world test championship a bit more because i think i'm suddenly watching all these results thinking like what do i need what do i need what do i need it's like you know the end of the premier league you know will your team qualify for europe will they uh avoid relegation <clears throat> it's all it's all that stuff they have brought into test cricket and it's absolutely brilliant like you know i have Ordinarily, I had no, <clears throat> didn't, couldn't care less about a series not involving Sri Lanka, and now suddenly every test, I'm like, right, what is the best result for Sri Lanka here? It's, it, I think it's absolutely brilliant. No, it's great, isn't it? And I think actually, uh, you know, there's been so much talk about the future of Test cricket outside of the big three, and I mean, you look at that table, and England are sitting in sixth, and yeah. having getting the opportunity to play a lot more. Test cricket than everyone else. I think they've played 18 games in this cycle, albeit that 10 of those have been against India uh, India and Australia, which, I mean, obviously makes things harder. But, you know, the fact that we're seeing New Zealand um, doing well, South Africa doing well, Sri Lanka doing well, Pakistan winning two tests against England, I think it's just a buffet, isn't it, for people who want to see Test cricket having a global future. And... I don't know, over the past few months, there seems to have been um, enough of those results that suggest that there is a future for the game outside of India, England and Australia, and that it's a better game with all these teams in it and all these teams 
fit and firing. And so, yeah, long may it last. Uh, and um, yeah, gosh, I mean, that Pakistan series was wild. After Pakistan lost to Bangladesh, I did not expect them, and well, and conceded 800. I didn't expect them to come and win two tests. And it's been, yeah, really exciting watching. It just goes back to that thing that with, with all... I, was just, I, I reckon with all the South Asian countries and the West Indies, you can just never really fully write them off because there's always talented players and there's always players who, who probably aren't quite, for whatever reason, fully fulfilling their potential. And if you change stuff up, if you change things up, you can kind of stumble upon something, which is kind of like, you know, obviously if you're a Pakistan fan, you're probably going, yeah, it was it was an absolute masterstroke to appoint an umpire as a selector. But really, they just they just stuck their hand in a, in a bag and tried a load of different things. Yeah, and man, it, and like uh, Sajid Khan just comes out of nowhere. I mean, hardly played any international cricket. I think he's 29, 30, and then just, I mean, has an amazing series. I, seeing him, you know, like, swatting everything for six the other morning was just I thought that was incredibly joyful obviously not from an English perspective but uh yeah no it's great it's I think that yeah seeing um a bit of a global mix-up it's I mean it's obviously good for Sri Lanka in context of the World Test Championship and I think it's good for cricket this chaos yeah absolutely Nick should we leave it there yeah um... let's because you've got to get off uh, Liverpool Arsenal, to, don't you, Mark? Yeah, I've got to go to Arsenal to watch my beloved Liverpool. Uh, I'm getting ready for Chelsea Newcastle, and we're both probably going to tune into the start of this emerging teams final. So, uh, yeah, let's get on with our Sundays. <laughs> Cool. Right. See you later. If you haven't done so already, hit the subscribe. Follow us on all social platforms. We've been the Morally End. We'll be back soon. Bye.